Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Peter Tobin. Tobin is a known rapist and serial killer, killing up in his native Scotland as well as on the south coast of England. He is known to have killed at least three people and is suspected of more. He is also suspected of being the unknown serial killer Bible John, although there is no proof for this. To find out more details, visit www.murderuk.com or stay tuned for a documentary about Peter Tobin. And please remember, please like this video and make a comment down below. What are your thoughts on this case? Thank you. This week, I'm investigating a rapist and serial killer who travelled up and down the country preying on young, vulnerable women. There are a handful of victims we know about, but police suspect many more. That man is Peter Tobin. We know that Tobin committed the last murder at quite a late age in life. He was 61 years of age. We also know that he committed two other murders in 1991 and buried the bodies in the garden of a house in Margate in Kent. And we also know that he was jailed for 14 years and did a 10 year sentence for the double rape of two girls that he drugged and thereafter raped. So we know that this man is an absolute serial killer and rapist. What's unique about the Tobin case is that it was the first time offender and geographic profiling had been used together in a nationwide operation to track a suspected serial killer. The senior investigating officer for Strathclyde Police was David Swindle. Hello, David Swindle. Hi, David Swindle. My name's Jackie Moulton, ex-Scotland Yard detective. I'm really looking forward to come and see you. If you will speak to me, David, about your role in Operation Anagram and the detection of Peter Tobin for a number of murders. Absolutely. Any exposure about Tobin uh, would help find out who else is killed. So you're interested in it because you believe, do you, that Tobin has killed other people? I believe Tobin has done and our crimes definitely killed other people. Because mm, it was quite a, a late time in his life to start raping well, and killing. Yes, you don't get to 60 years of age and, and kill someone the way he did. I look forward to seeing you, David. Thank you so much. I'm good, Jackie. OK, bye. This is the case of Peter Tobin, a Scottish serial killer. I'm heading up to Glasgow to meet retired Detective Superintendent David Swindle, who ran Operation Anagram. On the 24th of September 2006, Angelica Kluke, a 23-year-old Polish student, working as a cleaner at St. Patrick's Church in Glasgow, was reported missing by her boyfriend, Martin McCaskill. It was the discovery of her body five days later that would lead the police to discover two other murders over a decade earlier and confirm Tobin as one of Britain's most notorious serial killers. You were the detective superintendent in charge of CID at Strathclyde Police. What was the police response to the missing inquiry? This is a day that I'll never forget in my life. Um, the police officers, the uh, uniform officers, were dealing with that as a missing person inquiry at the time. Uh, the church had been searched uh, as, as a routine search. It was a missing person. And within three or four days, they were very concerned for her safety because the last person that she'd been with was identified as Peter Tobin, a missing sex offender. Now, no one knew he was that. He was using the name Patrick McLaughlin in the church and he actually had an identification tag which was Patrick McLaughlin. Tobin had been working at that church for some months, it was probably about six months. 
He was called the handyman at the church. He had been part of the Loaves and Fishes. It helps homeless people, it gives them food. So he had ingratiated himself into the church, helping people in the church. He was in a place that was full of vulnerable people. How did Peter Tobin get identified? The uniform officers that were dealing with the missing person inquiry had published this photograph in the newspaper. And it was through that that he was uh, identified. So Tobin's no longer around. You've got a missing person. What happened then as far as the police were concerned? So I arranged for the place to be searched, thoroughly searched by search experts. And I get the phone call about eight o'clock, quarter past eight that night, that Angelica had been found concealed under the floor of the church. There was a small trap door, but only he would know her. That is someone that has knowledge of that church. And she had been put in there, as the judge described it, totally disrespectful, like a bag of rubbish put under the floor. David Swindle and his team faced an extremely difficult crime scene. A narrow hatch was the only access through which they could retrieve crucial forensic evidence from Angelica's body. The advice I had was that she'd been stabbed so many times in the upper chest, and if they moved the body, that could have disturbed it or lost vital evidence. So I had to leave, made a decision, calculated, but it was in the advice of experts to leave this young woman's body underneath the church. When you I say leave her there, just leave her, do you mean leave her there in order to get a scientist? Scientist forensic, that was the advice we got from the scientist. So examine yeah. the body. Aye, that was the advice we got from the scientist, was that if you moved her, you know, we could lose evidence. So from what you're saying, Tobin is now on the run somewhere else. You've got a body, you've got a prime suspect. How did you find where Tobin was? So we were on public, you know, went on national TV and uh, it was on Sky. And it was a result of that that someone, a nurse in a hospital in London recognised him and he was using a, a, an alias, another alias. And the big thing is that they didn't have evidence at that point that Tobin was involved. And that was the thing I was concerned about. He was a missing sex offender mm -hmm. and there was a warrant, we got a warrant for him it breached reaching his, his conditions. Yeah, it breached his so he was arrested on that. That allowed us to get some time. Do you think he knew that you knew he was the prime suspect at that point? I think he did. But as far as I'm concerned, I think, you know, Tobin was, was always a prime suspect from day one and Tobin himself knew he was a prime suspect and I'm sure at that point he even knew that he was for other crimes as well. One of the things I found interesting from what David Swindle told me is the fact that because the body was in such an inaccessible place, stuffed in a hole under the floor, Strathclyde police were forced to leave the body there so that forensic evidence could be gathered in situ. That job fell to a young forensic scientist, Carol Rogers. David has given me her number, so I'm going to see if she's willing to meet. Hi, Carol, this is ex-detective Jackie Moulton. I'm looking into the murder of Angelica Kluke. I understand you have the challenging task of retrieving forensics at the scene, and I'd like to find out what you remember of that day. Hi Jackie, yes it's a case that I'll never forget, not only because the examination was carried out under the floorboards in the dark, but also because Angelique was a young woman with her whole life ahead of her and I would be happy to meet with you, yes. How difficult was it for you, Carol, to gain access through the void to Angelique's body? To give you an idea of how narrow it was, when I tried to go down into the hatch, I had my crime suit on and I had a pager on my belt and the gap was that narrow that the pager actually jammed me and I had to get the pager and wiggle it down into the leg of my crime scene suit so I could then fit through the gap, that's how, how tight it was. 
And how had she been deposited within the void? She was lying directly beneath the hatch. She was lying on her back and her legs were bent. So her knees were kind of bent backwards. So the lower half of her legs were underneath her body. I also understand, Carol, that Angelica had been gagged with mm -hmm. tape. Yeah. She had a, a J cloth in her mouth and she had insulating tape wrapped several times around her head, um, around her mouth, to, to gag her. So as a scientist, you're faced with this ordeal, really. Mm. Where did you go to first to collect any samples? And what were you looking for? I took some swabs from her body, from her abdomen, from her face, samples from her hands in case she'd been involved in a fight, if there'd been some sort of defence. And also her, the fly of her trousers is unbuttoned and I took samples round about her pants and her trousers, again, all in an attempt to recover DNA from anyone who's been in contact with these areas. Did you find any weapons down in the void at all? We did. When we opened the, the black bag that was on top of Angelica, there was a bloodstained knife. Now, it had been cleaned, but we found within the laboratory later on it was very heavy blood staining and that matched the DNA profile of Angelica Kluck. And we also found a small wooden block, which at the time we couldn't work out the part it played. But further down the line, the police searching the premises of the church found four wooden table legs. And one of those table legs was eventually examined and had blood matching Angelica on it. And there was wood in her head wound that matched his table leg. And can you tell me about a pair of jeans that was found in a bin near the murder site? Yeah, we had a, a pair of jeans submitted a few days after. Angelica's body was found and we examined them in the laboratory. We found what we call impact spatter blood spots on the jeans, which is typical of someone who's been involved in an assault. And those blood spots matched the DNA profile of Angelica. And on the fly area of the jeans, we found semen matching Peter Tobin, and that was mixed in with sterile material matching Angelica. That <coughs> huge amount of forensic evidence, isn't it? Yeah, we had body fluids, we had weapon, we had fingerprints. We had a two-way transfer, which as a forensic scientist, you know, is, is the best you can hope for. DNA from the accused on the victim and from the victim on the accused. We had the weapons, we had clothing more at the time of the murder. That There's nothing else you could really want forensically. It was a really strong forensic case, mm. yeah. I found Carol Rogers, what she had to say about the forensic evidence, fascinating. The fact that she had to go down this small void underneath the church in order to get the best forensic evidence. And of course, the forensic evidence in the case of Tobin and the murder of Angelica Kluke was vital. With the forensic evidence now gathered, Strathclyde police were able to build a detailed picture of what happened to Angelica in her final moments. I want to see for myself where this horrific murder took place. So I'm going to St. Patrick's Church with David Swindle. He's taking me to the garage next to the church where Tobin attacked Angelica. In there, this is where it started. This is where the blood was. This is where, uh, you know, he started that horrible attack. The, the, he hit her over the head with a like a, t a table leg, which was recovered. There was a, a piece of that in her head. We don't think this is near to where Angelica was deposited. The attack continued 
is it here and then he put it below the, below the floor. What astounds me, though, is that this is a church open to the public. Anybody could have walked in, or the priest could have walked in, or a member of the public could have walked in. Exactly. The church is open. Uh, there's an element, a real element of risk here. Just, this is the mark of him. You know, he's got no respect for anyone, or respect for humanity. He put, put her under the floor of his church, but not just you know, Angelica Clute, he put a bag with the bloodstained clothing, the knife that he'd used to stab her, all that was in there. And then he, he, he had cleaned up where it happened earlier on, tried to clean everything up. In my mind, you know, he was going to take her away. You don't think that this was going to be a permanent place to, for Angelica, that he was going to take her elsewhere? That's I think he was going, I think this was a temporary deposition site. I think he was going to take her somewhere else. For me, every time I come here, you know, and having dealt with this was, as an experienced senior investigating officer, this is one of the worst cases I have ever dealt with in my career, and it's something I'll never forget. And it's, every time I come into this church, I think, this was horrendous, absolutely horrendous, what he did to Angelica here. What I also think is, this person has never done, he's never, this isn't the first time he's done this. And that's what made me think, you know, we need to look at his whole life. He's 60, mm. you know? Nobody um, starts skinning at 60, do they? Well, you, you don't get to that stage, you know, and, and that theory was, you know, that theory was right. Yeah, he'd done it before. Convinced that Tobin had killed before, David Swindle and his team set up a separate investigation called Operation Anagram to uncover other possible victims. What was Operation Anagram? What it was, was I called it investigative analysis of a serial killer. So we took Tobin's life and looked at every single thing in his life. We timelined him away back. We relied on the public for this, putting it out there, this is Peter Tobin, this is where he was in these dates. And we obtained from all his, his friends, previous friends, his wife's or whatever, pictures of him then. What was his job? Tobin had various jobs. Every job you could imagine that would allow him opportunities to kill people. He was doing all sorts of illegal stuff, like bootlegging stuff. He was a driver. He worked for a car auction. He was taking cars from Glasgow to England. I mean, we quickly identified that, you know, that this guy, right through his life, uh, he is involved in all sorts of different types of crime. I've been looking into the evidence uncovered by Strathclyde Police, working on Operation Anagram, into the serial killer, Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin was one of quite a number of children, seven children, and he was the one that was the kind of, you know, disturbed. He was the one that kind of, from a very early age, was indicating kind of quite bad behavior. At the age of seven, Tobin was sent to reform school and would later spend time in a young offenders institute. Little is known about Tobin's early crimes, but his first attack on a woman happened when he was in his early 20s. Her name is Margaret, and she was just 17 when she became his girlfriend. Hi, Margaret, this is Jackie Moulton, ex-detective from the Met. I'd really like to talk to you about your time with Peter Tobin. Detective Superintendent David Swindle has told me that Tobin was extremely violent towards you, and I realise that it might be a very painful process to revisit this time, but I'd really appreciate it if you would be willing to meet with me. 
Hi, Jackie. I'd be only too happy to meet with you. I was only 17 years old at the time I met Peter Tobin. I'll never forget it. It was the worst year of my life. Margaret, how did you first meet Peter Tobin? My girlfriend and I were at uh, a dance hall in the centre of Glasgow, uh, the Highland, uh, Highlanders dance hall, and um, he just, him and his partner, asked us to dance. He was charming, he was he dressed well, very polite. He seemed to sort of just be very soft and, and sort of caring. And I was just sort of over the moon that I'd scored, you know, and he was such a nice guy. One weekend day, he took me back to his place, uh, his flat. He wanted to ask me if I wanted a cup of tea or coffee or took some tea. But we just chatted about anything and everything. We had cars in common. The afternoon just, just went and um, I said, well, I better get back for my dinner. Um, I'll maybe see you later tonight. So I went to the front door and I went to open it and it was just slammed shut in front of my face. He became quite violent then and sort of shook me and said, you're going to do as you're told now. Then the sort of sex started and it was quite rough. It was like torture as well as sex. And if I didn't conform, he always had this pen knife in his pocket and if I said no, I would just get stabbed in the side. It was never a deep enough blade that it would actually do any fatal harm. It, it was just a warning. I mean, my, my hips are like railway lines, you know, two or three times over. So how did you get out of the place that night? Well, I didn't. I was, that, that was me with Tobin then for the next year. Really? Yeah. And did he control who you saw when, when you went out? I didn't he, get out. He kept you hostage? Kept, he kept me in the flat all the time. I got walked in the flat. So there's no way that you could shout or scream or get out of a window or... Three, get floor, three floors up? No, yeah. not really. Yeah. That's quite... It's so upsetting to hear what happened to you. Yeah. Did you feel that you'd lost your own self-esteem? I lost my own independence. You lost everything? You yeah. lost yourself? I lost my own character. I would just... It, it wasn't me that... Did you feel like this complete possession? But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Margaret was so broken by the physical and mental abuse Tobin inflicted on her that he even forced her to marry him. After months of being under his total control, Tobin's violence escalated to the point when one evening he attacked her so viciously he left her for dead. There was one night I had had enough with him and I just blatantly said, no, I'm not having having any more sex with you. I'm, I'm too sore. And he just threw me onto the bed, got a serrated bread knife and put it inside me and turned it like a corkscrew, which is why I can't actually have children. Dear God. Uh, and left me for dead. Margaret was left unconscious and bleeding profusely from her wounds. She might have died, but for the fact a neighbour saw blood dripping through the ceiling below and called for an ambulance. What were you left with after this duration of time with Tobin and you took away your confidence, you, lose, you lost yourself? Mm -hmm. How long does it take for you for those mental and emotional and physical scars to kind of heal? They never heal. I mean, he, he left me childless. And no matter what anybody says, and for whatever reason that happens, you never get over the fact not being a proper mother. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got on and I've, I've succeeded in life. Obviously, you've yeah. succeeded, yeah. So I'm sort of proud of myself that way and I've got over the, the shock of it. But yeah, it's, it's always 
that there's something missing. And you often hear, you know, in the media, you know, why people don't go to the police and why they don't complain. And what was it that stopped them going? You've heard from Margaret today why she couldn't go to the police. She was absolutely scared stiff. And I've spoken over the years to many other victims who were just frightened of going to the police because they were on their own, they had nowhere to go. And also because the culture was, sadly, that domestic violence victims were never believed. I can't help thinking that if it hadn't been for the neighbour downstairs calling for help, Margaret would have probably been Tobin's first murder victim way back in 1969. This story makes clear to me that Tobin used coercion and control to get what he wanted. This pattern of manipulative behaviour would continue right up to his trial for the murder of Angelica Kluke in March 2007, when he tried to overturn the overwhelming forensic evidence against him. Dorothy Bain was the prosecutor in the Peter Tobin trial, so I want to find out her impression of him. Dorothy Bain, in 2007, you were the prosecuting counsel in the case of Peter Tobin. The importance of the scientific evidence. Yes. This was major forensic evidence, wasn't mm. it, that was presented to the court? Yes, the forensic scientists did the most amazing professional job and the evidence they secured ultimately played an important part in the conviction of Peter Tobin. Mm. Were there any complications in the Tobin case? Because part of Tobin's defence, as I understand it, was that he had consensual sex with Angelique Kluke. The defence counsel in the case was Donald Finlay QC. As part of the defence to the case that he would have been instructed to present to the jury, it did involve identifying that Angelica Kluke was perhaps promiscuous and had been in more than one sexual relationship at the time. But the young woman's diaries revealed a deep and loving relationship with Martin McCaskill. She described, for instance, times that they were together and they felt as if they were the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, reading her diaries about the relationship was very moving and it was a significant part of the case in court that her diaries were read and the jury were informed of the extent of her relationship with Martin McCaskill. But when you're kind of looking at Tobin on a daily basis or you're, you're conscious of his presence in the dock, what was your impression about this man that was sitting in the dock before you that had been accused yes. of this horrendous murder? It struck me that he was very slight, small and seemed insignificant. Mm -hmm. He was somebody that you wouldn't give him a second thought to. You certainly wouldn't have looked at him and thought that he was capable of what he did. After a six-week trial in May 2007, Peter Tobin was found guilty of the rape and murder of Angelica Kluke and sentenced to a minimum of 21 years in prison. With Tobin now convicted, David Swindle and his team from Operation Anagram were able to continue questioning him about his past in their hunt to uncover other potential victims. Operation Anagram discovered that 16 years earlier, in 1991, Tobin had remarried, had a young son, and was living in the town of Bathgate in Scotland. They also discovered that in the same year, a teenager, 15-year-old Vicky Hamilton, was reported missing. She was last seen in Bathgate. Detective Bert Swanson, who worked on the original missing person case, was alerted to this new piece of evidence. Hi Bert, this is Jackie Moulton, former detective at the Met. 
David Swindle has given me your name and number, and I'd like to talk to you about the Vicky Hamilton case, if that would be okay with you. Yes, I was in charge of the review. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But in 1991, Vicky Hamilton was 15 years of age. She'd gone to see her sister, who was living in a town called Livingstone on the, near Edinburgh. And Vicky was last seen in Bathgate in the town centre eating some chips and, uh, and from then was never seen again. That's correct. That's it in a nutshell, in effect. I mean, she was, a, she was perhaps immature for her years. She had never gone on her own, and so this was an adventure to her. And uh, sadly, it involved two buses, it involved the change. She was constantly asking about the, where do I change, what time do I get off, what time is this bus? So it was an adventure, and it, sadly it was her first, and as I understand it, her last. At the time that she had gone missing, did the police find any of Vicky's property, a bag or a handbag? Yes, it was about a week after that day Vicky went missing, that, that a purse which was subsequently found to be the property of Vicky it was recovered in St Andrews Square in Edinburgh, which is right next to the bus station. The, the police investigating the disappearance of Vicky had kept that purse? Kept the purse. My concern with the purse was that I was aware that the programme, uh, the missing person, Vicky Hamilton, had featured on Crime Watch at some stage. And I viewed that programme and uh, I was kind of horrified to see that they had the purse sitting on the desk and it was with no paper, no wrapping, nothing on it. It was unprotected from everything. We speak about DNA. It was 1991, and although DNA was there, there were still forces that it was relatively new, and you didn't really explore and exploit it to the maximum. The purse became a problematic piece of evidence, so I'm meeting with cold case reviewing officer for Strathclyde Police, Derek Patterson, to find out what they did next. The purse was complicated in the sense that we weren't overly optimistic about finding uh, DNA from it, but the most likely DNA profile you would get in those circumstances would be from Vicky, bearing in mind she was the owner of the purse. However, it didn't transpire that way. A profile was developed from the purse, which eventually we found was a very, very close match to the suspect in the case. The DNA profile from the purse was not from Peter Tobin, but it was from a very close relative, which then led to swabs being taken from his son and the final match. Peter Tobin had brought up his son from where he lived with his mum down south and for a little holiday. So we know that Peter Tobin had his son at the time with him, just a small child. Yeah. Yeah. When Vicky Hamilton went missing. Yeah, it was always assumed that Tobin's son had put the purse to his mouth, simply because saliva is such a good source for, for DNA. And to think that it had survived having been outdoors, uh, having been through all the various hands, it was a, an excellent recovery, it was excellent work. The police now had solid forensic evidence. They had Vicky's purse with a strong DNA link to Tobin. Then, after a search of Tobin's house in Bathgate, they discovered a knife with traces of Vicky's DNA. But the big problem was they didn't have a body. Operation Anagram began sharing information with other police forces. One of them was Essex Police who informed them that another teenager had also gone missing in 1991. Her name was Dinah McNichol. The team began looking at other addresses that Tobin had occupied and made a significant and chilling discovery. Soon after Vicky Hamilton had disappeared and just before Dinah had disappeared, 
Tobin had moved from Bathgate to a house in Margate in Kent. It was enough evidence to instigate a police search of Tobin's Margate address. Lucy Cyborn was the forensic archaeologist brought in to lead the search for Dinah's body. Lucy Cyborn, I understand you were called to a house in Margate to do an archaeological dig. Right. What were you told about this incident? They thought uh, the body of Dinah McNichol may be on the premises somewhere in the garden or the house. Um, could we assist with the investigation to see if we could locate the body if it was there. So the first thing we need to do is try and establish what the ground would be like if it hadn't been disturbed. So we know what we're looking for. So then we recognise any changes and, and disturbance. A cut had been made down through the soils into the chalk. We recognised that we had disturbance, so we start excavating that cut and we came across black bin liner. Then clearing it, we could see there are in fact two black bin liners there. And the size and shape suggested that they could have been a person. When you say you've got two bin liners, does that mean the body had been cut in half? Yes. Yeah. Crikey. So you hand the body over to the police, a subsequent post-mortem. What were you told about the person, the body, what had happened? We were told that uh, we'd assumed we would, we'd found Dinah McNichol, uh, and then when we returned the next day, the post-mortem had established that it wasn't Dinah, it was, in fact, Vicky Hamilton. Police suspect that having picked up Vicky Hamilton from the bus stop, Peter Tobin had lured her back to his flat where he murdered her. Some time later, he transported her body south to Margate, where he buried her in the garden of 50 Irvine Drive. Tobin reportedly told his neighbour that he was digging a sandpit for his son. And was Dinah McNichol in that garden? Yes. Yeah. And where was she in comparison to where Vicky Hamilton was situated? On the same side of the garden, and Dinah McNichol was underneath the patio, so much closer to the house. Was Dinah McNichol in plastic bags, and was she a complete body, or had been severed? Complete body, yep, in plastic bags, and then encased in concrete. Dear, dear. The discovery of the two bodies confirmed Detective David Swindle's worst fears that Peter Tobin was indeed a serial killer. I'm returning to see David Swindle to find out how Tobin reacted to the charges. What did he say in interview about two bodies are in a garden at Margate for which he lived in that house? What did he say to that? Someone must have put them there. He was fitted up. Okay. His fingerprint, everything. It's about control. It's about power. And that's what he wants all the time. Because every time the, the officer was interviewing him, he wanted to try something else. Can you get me cigarettes? Can you bring me a book? Can you do this? And he just wants to control everything. He thinks he's going to get away with it. He's so arrogant on it. In 2008, Tobin was charged and faced two separate trials for the murders of Vicky Hamilton and Dinah McNichol. He was found guilty and received two further life sentences. Since his convictions, Tobin has refused to cooperate with detectives investigating other possible victims. We would never have known if it hadn't been, sadly, for the murder of Angelica Kluke, and if it hadn't been for me forming Operation Anagram, we would never had Vicky Hamilton and Dynamite Nicole and results for what happened for their family. The thing is, these are the ones we know about. My feeling is that we don't have everything. We don't know all the victims that Tobin has killed. He's done 
more. He's done others, uh, I'm sure of that. Um, but because of the way he targets people, because of the way he conceals the, the victims' bodies, we'll never know. But for me, Tobin's multiple convictions still beg the question of what drove him to commit such brutal and degrading crimes. Someone who has been examining Tobin's case and may have some answers is forensic psychologist Dr Julian Boone. In interviews, he shows no remorse and, uh, you know, just has no kind of conscience at all about anything that is done. Yes, well, the no remorse bit does not come as a surprise to me in the slightest. It's probably one of the few times he's ever been honest about anything. Would you describe Tobin as a psychopath? Yes, I would. I don't think there's any room for doubt about that. To be able to perform these atrocious acts, and as we say, probably many more of them, and to openly declare that he had absolutely no remorse or regrets at all. If he said that, then um, that ipso facto puts him down as a psychopath. And is that how you would categorise him as a killer? Yes, I would. And uh, a relatively organised sexual murderer who is a psychopathic, yes, I would. When he killed uh, Angelica Kluke, Tobin was 61 years of age. Is that quite unusual for a man to carry on being a serial killer since he started, as we know, in 1991? Nothing's going to stop him having these urges. Nothing at all. And uh, they are very, very deeply seated. They must be. If, if he has that same sort of modus operandi, I, for one, wouldn't want to put any money down at all that he would stop. And uh, behind bars is where he should stay. I want to return to the church where Angelica was murdered, a place where you would never expect such a brutal crime to take place. I think it's poignant that we're standing in this beautiful church, which for people that come to church is a place of sanctuary, a place of worship, a place of peace. And this church was the scene of a terrible murder. Tobin knew that Angelica was working here in order to better her life as a young student. So it just sits with you really, really uncomfortable in this beautiful church. People come to churches to confess their sins. Tobin is committing the greatest sin in this church. So there's that poignancy, it's just despicable. As a detective, I've investigated numerous murder cases. And what always hits me is the sheer waste of life. Here we have three young women whose lives were brutally cut short in such a horrific manner. The perpetrator has been jailed for the rest of his life, but that's no comfort for the families and friends of these women. I know they will never be forgotten. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.